something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time to stop Children, what's that sign? Everybody look what's going down Whenever there's war, then poverty is at the corner. So you see you're displaced, you lose everything that you have. So the only thing that you're left is your life, so you run. Most of the African countries that are poor now is because they're in war. Arms are a problem because they feel conflict, they feel poverty, and they feel serious human rights abuses. Um, in many parts of the world where Oxfam works, our staff and our partners on the ground see the devastating reality of this every day as people's lives are literally torn apart by the, the unregulated flood of weapons into already difficult situations. For many years, Oxfam, Amnesty International and IANSA had witnessed the human cost of arms abuses. And in 2003, they joined forces to campaign for global controls through an international arms trade treaty. With the arms trade being such a global animal, uh, so many countries are involved in the production and the distribution of weapons, it became impossible to look at it without a system of global global rules. I, as a war zone veteran, always thought, but quite honest, it was a, it was a hopeless case because these, these, these millions of weapons sort of wash around the world and, uh, and where they're needed, a, a way will be found, rather like, like water finding its own way. This film tells the story of the control arms campaign so far and how campaigners have successfully influenced governments and international policy on arms. We are three different organizations, but I think we saw the cause. We saw what we wanted to achieve. We saw what we needed and we're able to, you know, put aside our own differences and our own identities and became one to achieve this. We have this big aim and uh, we needed to create uh, a kind of critical path, how to reach the arms trade treaty. So we need to do a lot of lobbying, a lot of meeting with governments, uh, a lot of engaging uh, the actors, the political actors to promote the treaty. In order to do that, we need to get people in the streets uh, and uh, people uh, at home recognize that there is a need for an arms trade treaty. There is an issue linked to the uncontrolled uh, arms trade uh, and therefore there is a need of control, controlling it. Research and quality research is is fundamentally important. It's the building blocks to your campaign. It, it, it provides the reason and the rationale for, for why you're doing it. It provides the irrefutable case. With the research underway and the strategy in place, the next step was to demonstrate to politicians that there were huge levels of public support. The global launch of the Control Arms campaign was on October 9, 2003. We've been up since dawn, um, but, but quite excited because it's all, it's all coming together. Um, the press conference is going to start um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of hours. Um, we're expecting lots of people to come down. Um, the media will be arriving to take photographs and it's all kicking off. It was a very good uh, mixture of different campaigning techniques that they work out very well. At the same time, we had the launch in about 60 countries simultaneously. I try and try to make a difference. Where, 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 back you are. In the Philippines, um, they had a massive firework display and they had speakers from across civil society. Um, in West Africa, they had um, musicians and they had public figures and, again, NGOs talking about why this was such a problem. So there were lots of different things that happened in, in lots of different countries. The idea of petition had, had almost been a campaigning idea that had been done to death. So many campaigns had a petition, so we wanted a very, very different take on it. When we looked at the arms trade, what we saw was a very very faceless, secretive, shady world of, of dealing. And a way to confront that was for ordinary people to stand up in a very visual and public way to say that I'm simply a face against a faceless arms trade. You could submit your face through sort of posting emails and, and, and that kind of thing to sort of encapsulate the new trend towards digital imaging, digital cameras, mobile phones. We were able to recruit probably about 60 countries working on the campaign. But many of them, uh, they had lots of logistical problems in collecting faces. They didn't have cameras, they didn't have facilities with the computer. And one uh, 
way that we solved that was the idea of creating like a face card where people could draw their own face that it was a huge success for many countries where they don't have the facilities. We are calling for about one million people to submit their faces to the government as well as to the United Nations to urge for an international control on arms transfers. I've seen for myself uh, how activism does really work. It does give you the feeling that you as an individual, as just an ordinary voter, can play your part in achieving political change. A staff member from Oxfam went to, to, to South Africa and trained a group of young people, unemployed, who volunteered to to do the to collect the million faces and I think in a short space of time, I think about three weeks or so, they were able to collect about twenty thousand faces. One of the reasons why the campaign got uh, such massive popularity in Kenya is because it's a very, very real campaign. It talks about issues that affect ordinary Kenyans. When you lobby, sometimes with the government they look at who is lobbying them and where are they coming from. You know, what experience are they trying to bring to, you know, to the front because it's very hard to say you talk to a government in Africa and you come from Europe and you say, oh, I want you to support this because you know people in Africa are suffering. Who are you to speak for Africans? You know, who are you to speak for those people who you even don't know? I, I think the advocacy, you know, has has been very effective indeed, and the use of the media, but so civil society also, you know, using ordinary, you know, persons and at the society at the grassroots level, be it in the in the villages, be it uh, in the in the township as well. Over the course of the campaign, one of the main techniques used to communicate to the public and to influence politicians was through the media. The issue of armed scandals was really important. Governments don't like to be embarrassed. There was a photograph taken in the height of a massacre by the Uzbek security forces against ordinary people. In the corner of that massacre was a military Land Rover vehicle. That example in itself has pushed governments to think that the arms trade treaty, a global solution, is important, but that also the UK has to look very hard at its own controls because there's something wrong in the system that allows this to happen. One of the strengths of the control arms campaign is that we've been able to translate this complex issue into um, language that is simple and accessible so that we're able to communicate it out to a very wide audience. Most of these countries would not be allowed to sell the helicopter in its entirety to China, and yet broken down, flat-packed essentially, into its component parts, they're not breaking any laws. We think this is a problem. The arms trade has become globalised and that's why it needs global controls. This has been particularly important when we've taken research, for example, policy briefings and so on, and have been able to turn that into a digestible form that we can easily communicate it out to journalists, to the media, to politicians in some cases, and to a wide supporter base. A way to capture media interest in different countries was to work with public figures and celebrities and also to communicate the powerful stories of real people. Anyone who's had direct experience of, of armed violence themselves is an even more powerful advocate and a good example of that would be Emmanuel Jal who was a former um, child soldier in Sudan and he's now launched a successful career as a, as a rap artist. Left home at the age of seven, one year later lived with an AK-47 by my side, slept with one eye open wide. A testimony of a human story is powerful and it's powerful when it comes from the person who's talking about it and I think uh, not only me but other people who gave their stories as well. It's not just a, an NGO person talking to me on screen but this is someone who's been directly affected by armed violence speaking is, a, is another powerful way of communicating. <laughs> Tactically, the strategy was to work with the countries that supported the campaign and target countries that would in turn influence those around them. A key turning point came in March 15, 2005, when UK Foreign Secretary Jack Straw announced publicly the government's support for an arms trade treaty. We've been trying very, very hard to, to move the government to support the arms trade treaty, but we didn't see the fruition of that work until till the moment it happened and it was it, it, it was a landmark decision one one day they were skeptical and quietly opposing the next day they were supporting wholeheartedly it 
it's very important that the UK, as a major arms manufacturer, uh, should take a major role in this activity. We knew other countries simply could not then ignore the call for, a, for an arms trade treaty. And it, it, and it came as no surprise that within a matter of months, the whole of the European Union rallied behind, behind the call. In 2005, when uh, all the governments from Mercosur uh, made a very positive statement uh, in support of the treaty. And that was very important because uh, it was the first time that uh, uh, other countries from different regions that were Europe started to make a very positive uh, statement or approach to the treaty. There were two major political opportunities in 2006 for campaigners to highlight the need for international arms control. The first, the UN Review Conference in June, was chosen as the perfect moment for Julius Arile to hand in the Million Faces petition to then UN General Secretary Kofi Annan. I am here today because of uh, problems in my country, Kenya. Julius comes from a village called Kanyarkwa, which is in West Pokot. He used to lead a team of 20 warriors who would go cut a wrestling from village to village. That was his work. That's how he, he ensured that his family had food. One of the things that Jul Julius did is that he walked to the police station and he handed over his AK-47. Then we decided this was a man he wanted to use in the campaign. Julius, I'm honored to receive this petition in recognition of the people in more than 160 countries who have supported it and given it a million faces. We geared up almost two years' work of campaigning energy to that, that moment. We had a sort of 100 days countdown with a series of examples, reports, media, press conferences, stunts all around the world. What eventually happened was that there were sort of five or six governments that didn't agree, five or six governments that thought things like an arms trade treaty were not feasible, they just didn't, didn't want it. On paper, the review conference in July 2006 was a failure. There was no outcome document a few countries were able to block any outcome because it was based on a, a consensus decision-making system. However, from our perspective as campaigners, there was still some success. We'd wanted to raise the profile of the need for greater arms control, we'd wanted to get the media interested, we'd wanted to get politicians more involved and generally more talking about it. We managed this and now the challenge was to take that momentum and put it towards the next big event in October 2006. It was a very concrete opportunity. You know, in campaigning we do a lot of uh, strategizing, brainstorming, sitting in a room, but that was really the first opportunity we have, where there was something on a table and we campaigned and we had the opportunity to move that forward and make that resolution be approved or supported by as many governments as possible. In September 2006, a team of international lobbyists, campaigners and media professionals descended on New York for the second big political moment. A resolution to start work on an arms trade treaty had been tabled at the United Nations General Assembly. After days of intense meetings and high-level lobbying, the campaigner's main aim was to bring as many countries on board as possible and win a majority vote. We wanted to make sure that we got round to every single government delegation. And that's not as easy as it sounds because um, there's lots of committees that are going on all the time. Some of the smaller countries have only got one representative who is stretched between attending lots of different meetings. And we wanted to make sure that we met with every government and, and that every government had the opportunity to hear what we were saying about the arms trade treaty. So we came up with the idea of a race. We're going to be visiting all 192 missions and we're going to be doing it in 192 minutes. I think in our group we had about 16 missions to visit. And then we text to the people inside the UN and say, we visit Afghanistan. I'd get that text and then I'd give a, um, a compliment slip um, to another uh, colleague waiting inside the UN and they would go inside the UN meeting hall and tell them, we have already visited your mission and we have asked them to vote in favour. And uh, it was really, you know, everybody was interested in that. They kept that big tally sheet outside the... Um, the first committee room with, with ticking off the numbers as people came on board the resolution. It's been an amazing day actually just having people's reactions to the way the fact that we were running, reading our signs. Some woman asked me on Second Avenue 
what are you running for? And we all went an arms trade treaty like that. So it's really exciting. I think the marathon was one of the moments when it really gave us the feeling that lots of people they were going to vote for it. The main issue would that it was uh, not if it would pass or not, but how many countries would voted in against it. And we were really worried that all the major, like China, Russia, Egypt, uh, India, would have voted against it. We were poised there, ready to, to, to note it all down. And when, it was, when the resolution was, was read out, there was suddenly just a, a flood of green lights went up. There was only one red light that appeared at, at the bottom from the US. So it, it was passed with an overwhelming majority. The campaign had exceeded many people's expectations. This was a time to celebrate and communicate the success to supporters across the world. But there's still a long way to go. I think the next step is going to be much harder, which is to get a treaty that has uh, enough teeth to be realistic and, and be effective, uh, and enough nations signing, signing onto it. I think that's the really hard part. The next phase after the vote went through was that the UN Secretary General um, held a formal consultation during 2007 on what should be in the arms trade treaty, basically, with all member states. We wanted to make sure that all those states that had voted yes, 153, got the opportunity to input to this consultation, and that their, their consultation also reflected the demands from ordinary people around the world. So we launched a people's consultation in parallel to this formal UN consultation. <laughs> Eu sou a Liliane, eu vim participar das consultas populares. A ONU acabou de aprovar uma resolução para criar um tratado internacional de comércio de armas. A gente quer influenciar o que o governo brasileiro é, vai pedir para incluir no tratado. Então a gente teve a ideia de fazer consultas populares com vários grupos diferentes representativos da sociedade civil é, para mostrar o que, que o país realmente quer é, desse tratado. The creativity, the energy, the momentum that has been generated by the involvement of grassroots activists around the world is what's made politicians listen and it's what made governments act. We need to keep that pressure up. This campaign is ultimately about people. It's about ordinary people's lives being torn apart by armed violence and it's about ordinary people responding to that and saying to their governments, enough is enough, you've got to act. Governments have listened, they are starting to take action, but we need to keep that pressure up until we get a tough, effective treaty in place and until we make a real difference to ordinary people's lives on the ground. In order to minimize and prevent horrific crimes like what I experienced from happening again. Gun violence is, is real, it's all over the world. And for me to travel thousands of miles from my home country to come and speak at the UN um, clearly shows the extent of the effects of gun violence. The control arms campaign continues using different tactics and strategies, but its one clear aim to achieve an effective arms trade treaty remains the same. The ATT represents something new. It is a different approach to international politics. Uh, it's an approach which is pragmatic but not unprincipled. Uh, it's an approach which reaches out to new groups and creates new alliances. Uh, I hope there'll be more of them. Uh, this is the way to do international politics in the 21st century. I think it takes motivation. You need to believe in the cause. You need to believe it's possible and achievable, but also that it's fundamentally important. You need an awful lot of hard work and you need to be tenacious. You must never, ever, ever give up. Even at the darkest moments when you think that no one is gonna support you, you need to keep going. Don't
violence, I wipe it away. Gunshots, killing people every day. 